know, it just wouldn't be a week complete on the mainstream media without a war criminal being given a platform to sell their new book. Although Dubia is now focused on finger-painting world leaders, another orchestrator of the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan made the rounds on the corporate media last week. Yes, none other than Bush's partner in war crime from across the pond, former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Here he is blaming the West's failure in Iraq on Islam as an undefeatable political ideology. This ideology is not going to be defeated by an engagement in Afghanistan, in Iraq, or even in these individual arenas. It's going to be defeated over a long period of time. We're talking in the end about one struggle. It's got many different aspects to it. There are lots of local factors, but in the end, it is about this toxic mixture of religion and politics. And the reason why Iraq was difficult, Afghanistan was difficult, is precisely because of that. Well, one UK politician is working to expose Tony Blair in an upcoming documentary called The Killing of Tony Blair. His name is George Galloway, and he's a member of UK's Respect Party. Galloway joined me earlier from London, and I started out by asking him to respond to Blair's comments about Islam. Well, I, I think uh, uh, difficult, uh, the word he used, uh, is uh, well chosen. It's difficult when a million people have died as a result of the lies that you told. It's difficult when you've got to effectively gridlock the state inquiry into the events uh, around the Iraq war. It's difficult when you are so hated in your own country that you need a phalanx of machine gun toting police officers paid for by the taxpayer in every one of your seven homes, seven, S-E-V-E-N, seven <laughs> homes and four machine gun police on every one of them. It's difficult when you can't have a public engagement except in a place like Bloomberg's and where they bring the city of London to a halt in order to quarantine you from the public. That's what he meant by difficult. That day at Bloomberg's might be the day when we finally conclude that Tony Blair went berserk. George Orwell in his novel, and it was a novel, not a blueprint, not a manual, uh, 1984, uh, of course, memorably set the novel at a time when Eurasia was always at war with East Asia. And it's Mr. Blair's Manichaean view of the world that the West will always be at war with the East. And the grotesque uh, parody uh, of democracy that he was talking about is shown by the fact that he's a backing the military junta in Egypt that overthrew the elected government and calling for all of us to get behind Saudi Arabia, the least free and least democratic uh, country on the earth. And his elastic definition of extremism is demonstrated by the fact that he wants us all to get behind Al-Qaeda in Syria whilst being at permanent war with the Al-Qaeda mindset everywhere else or almost everywhere else in the world. This was the edge of insanity from Tony Blair, but it dominated the British news agenda and even reached you in the United States for fully 48 hours, as if uh, the oracle had descended amongst us with tablets of stone to distribute around us to discuss, but most people in this country feel only disgust for this man and the recipe of endless war, carnage and suffering that he prescribes. And lastly, if I may, he's not intending fighting himself in this never-ending war, neither is he intending sending his own sons to go and fight in this never-ending war. He's ready to fight to the last drop of everybody else's blood, somebody else's son's blood. That's what's disgusting about him. And it's no surprise, George, that so many American channels are giving Blair a platform to espouse his pro-interventionist views, which makes me thankful that I'm given a platform here to speak against all military intervention, to counter that narrative at least. But unfortunately, I've come under a lot of criticism because of the corporate media's Cold War resurrection, George. I recently did an interview on BBC that was completely pulled before it was even aired, after I criticized the UK government. What does that say about the state of media in the UK?
Well, we call ourselves a democracy, but in fact, we're an organized hypocrisy. We're speaking now on RT, uh, which is routinely described by the BBC as Russian state media. But BBC is British state media. What you did over the Ukraine, no BBC correspondent would ever dream of doing vis-a-vis -vis British policy that they disagreed with, if indeed they did disagree with it. There is no way that this Cold War rhetoric can be anything but damaging and debilitating for everyone in the world. And uh, the battle lines are being drawn. John Kerry, uh, more or less, called for RT to be struck off the air. Uh, in the Liberal Guardian newspaper, God save us from liberals, I always say, uh, they, last week, were drawing attention to the need for a state investigation into RT because its political line is not to the liking of these liberals. Presumably Fox News, uh, which goes uncomplained of, uh, is more to their liking. They can live with Fox News freely broadcasting on the British airwaves, but they can't, it seems, uh, live with RT. And uh, this tells you all you need to know about their skin-deep facade of liberalism and, uh, and commitment to freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. I just returned this hour from Paris, where I was interviewing a man who spent six years on the Gaddafi torture tables. He was illegally rendered, which as we both know means he was kidnapped and sent to those torture tables by those paragons of liberalism, the United States and Great Britain. So when they tell you how much they believe in Western values, the faster you should count your spoons, as Oscar Wilde would put it. <laughs> well, well said. Uh, let's move on to the UK elections, which are on the horizon. Of course, we know what a dog and pony show American elections are. Where Obama and Romney both spent a billion dollars last campaign cycle, now Jim Messina and David Axelrod, check this out, two of Obama's former campaign managers will be working for both Britain's conservative and labor parties. George, how do you feel about American political strategy being exported to Britain? Actually, all three of the mainstream parties, and if a backside could have three cheeks, they <laughs> would be the three cheeks of the same backside. Uh, they're all, their election campaigns are all being run by foreigners, one Australian and two Americans. And so, uh, heaven help us, we're in for an election as banal as the ones that you have to tolerate, where multi-millionaire Tweedledee contests multi-millionaire Tweedledum and they tell us that only an inch uh, is the inch that's worth debating. The prevailing orthodoxy, which uh, Dr. Johnson, the great English man of letters, described as the grimmest dictatorship of them all, the dictatorship of the prevailing orthodoxy. Some of us are struggling to break free of that on the left and on the right. Uh, the right probably, I'd have to concede, having more success. It's easy to sell nationalism to the simple-minded. It's a little more difficult selling socialism to an informed electorate. But UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, which is a far-right, europhobic party, is set to win the European Parliament elections here in Britain. And indeed, parties like them are set to win almost a third of the vote, one in three, of all the votes that will be cast in the European Union parliamentary elections uh, later, uh, about five, four weeks from now. Uh, that tells you that the stranglehold that the prevailing orthodoxy has on the public is very fast dissipating. And that's manifested in voting patterns, in people not voting at all, in people searching out other television stations other than the lamestream ones. It's all falling apart, which is why I'm actually relatively cheerful, because I absolutely am convinced that that prevailing orthodoxy, that dictatorship of the prevailing orthodoxy, 
is creaking and falling apart at the seams. Uh, speaking of nationalism, another major political issue in the crosshairs of the voting public in the UK is Scottish independence. Now, I wanted to get your opinion on this because I'm getting constantly hit up by people wanting me to cover it. Noam Chomsky recently came out in support of the movement, but you have said no, and I wanted to get your opinion. Why? Because I believe that class is the primary uh, division amongst people, not uh, nationality, which is uh, here today and, uh, and gone tomorrow, once upon a time. Scotland might well have joined France, wanted to join France, and uh, I'd be talking to you now in a quite different language if we had. There are many states that have broken up over the last decades, and frankly, uh, it's very rarely a success story. And uh, so be careful what you wish for, I say to the Scottish people, though the fact that we're even in danger of Britain breaking up a small island of English-speaking people. And incidentally, I'm not sure there's ever been a case where a country where everyone speaks the same language has ever broken up before, unless one were to pray and aid Yugoslavia, and I think that would be a very bad example to choose. But the fact that we're even in danger of seeing Britain breaking up is part of this previous conversation we've just been having, the prevailing orthodoxy creaking and falling apart at the seams. People hate the British state in Scotland. They hate its role in the world, war after war after war. They hate the neoliberal economics, the corrupt politics at Westminster behind me. And they think wrongly, in my view, that this can be solved by severing the country uh, uh, along uh, a border uh, which uh, will make foreigners of working people in the north of England, the Midlands of England, or in the poor parts of London. It's part of the rhetoric of Scottish nationalism that London is the problem, that the streets of London are paved with gold. But of course, that's not true of London any more than it's true of New York. The streets of a small part of London are paved with gold. But there's more poverty within six miles radius of where I'm sitting right now in London than there is in the entirety of Scotland or any other part uh, of the United Kingdom. Some of the poorest people in the country live uh, within a few miles of the city of London, in fact, within a few hundred yards of the city of London in the traditional east end of the country. So I don't want working people to be divided. I want working people to unite against those with whom they are objectively divided. Income inequality is rising faster here in America than anywhere else. Um, we're definitely right there with you. These problems are shared worldwide. Thank you so much for fighting on the ground. George Galloway, member of the UK Respect Party, amazing to have you on.